Hi, this is Adnan Bekal from Global Cyber Alliance. Hi, Graciela. This is uh, Amy Larson Kirkpatrick with the Global Cyber Alliance. Um, do you want us to get started or do you want us to hold off a minute or two? So, good morning to everybody. Can you listen to me? Good morning to everybody. Thank you very much for joining the Reducing Systemic Cyber Risk webinar. This web webinar is given to our constituency LACNIC members as part of the security awareness program of the warning, advice, and reporting point LACNIC systems. We will provide an overview of two free tools that Global Cyber Alliance has developed for anyone to use them and how you can take advantage of them. The webinar will take a couple of hours and it will be delivered in three sessions. At the end of each session, we will have some minutes for questions and answers. All the questions must be done by chat. In case you have any question, please write it on the window chat and remember it must be addressed to everybody. In the first session, Amy Larson Kirkpatrick, Global Communications Officer, will introduce the Global Cyber Alliance, Cyber Alliance to us. The second session, Adnan Baikal, Global Technical Advisor, will present an email protection tool, DMARC, domain-based message authentication, reporting, and conformance, and during the third session, Adnan will present the Enicas Recursive DNS Service Free Tool, which provides serious security against bad and malicious websites. Both speakers have huge expertise, and you can find their biographies on the event site. Thank you very much. Amy, we can listen to you now. Thank you, Graciela. And thank you everyone for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, we thought we would start by giving you some background information about our organization so you understand who we are. We are the Global Cyber Alliance. We are a international cross-sector nonprofit. We were founded two years ago by the City of London Police, the District Attorney of New York, and the Center for Internet Security. The District Attorney of New York was the driving force behind the founding of our organization. He wanted to reduce cyber risk uh, proactively. He prosecutes, investigates and prosecutes a lot of uh, cyber crime and really wanted to uh, see what he could do on the prevention side as he recognized that this is not an issue that we can prosecute our way out of. So he put $25,000, I'm sorry, $25 million worth of funding over five years to found our organization so that we could work on producing solutions to help reduce systemic cyber risk. We are a nonprofit 501c3 organization. We are not pay to play. It does not cost any money to join us or to use our solutions. They are freely available to anybody who would like to use them. We have, as I mentioned, the significant seed funding, which allows us to, uh, to openly share what we're doing. Um, we have um, a robust technical staff. 
Please wait for some minutes until we can go on because um, while the speakers are uh, giving the, the sessions, we have to wait at the end of each session to uh, write the questions that we have uh, within the chat window. Thank you. Is, as I mentioned, on the implementation of solutions that can mitigate cyber risk and all of those solutions that we put in place, we also want to be able to measure um, their impact. Uh, you can uh, skip to the next slide, Adnan. Thank you. Uh, he here's just a, a quick look at where our partners are uh, currently located. Um, as you can see, we are very much global in nature. Next slide. Um, so uh, I'll just say a couple more words about the, um, how our organization is structured. We have our founders, um, but we are run by a board of directors. Um, our board of directors um, is Scott Charney from Microsoft, Tools Ortin from Barclays, Sean Henry from CrowdStrike, Yuri Green from uh, Yuri Ito from CyberGreen, and Will Pelgrin. They provide the oversight for our organization. Uh, we also have a strategic advisory board that is made up of um, senior leaders in government and industry, and they inform the way that uh, we approach solutions and give us critical advice on how we operate. And then in the building of the solutions that we have, we also have technical advisory committees. They act as subject matter expert, experts and provide uh, critical input into how we build our solutions and how we solve the, the problems that we do. Um, anybody is welcome to participate with us. And um, next, Adnan is going to go into uh, the two solutions that we've currently built, uh, the last year has been spent looking at the systemic risk of phishing, and we've developed two solutions to uh, combat phishing. Um, but before we move on, now's the time that we're happy to answer any questions that folks may have about our organization. So, Gracia, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to facilitate that. Okay. Has anybody... Uh, has any answer, any question to Amy about the organization, Global Cyber Alliance? Okay, let's go on. We don't have any questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is Adnan Baikal, and I'm the Global Technical Advisor for Global Cyber Alliance. As Amy uh, indicated, uh, the first global cyber risk we wanted to tackle was uh, phishing. As we know, most of the cyber attacks, actually over 80% of the cyber attacks originate or leverage phishing in, in some shape or form. So we wanted to see if we could address phishing in a in couple different ways. And uh, what we said was, uh, both in our strategic advisory committee and technical advisory committee, that uh, we could uh, address phishing in two different ways. The first is we can try to reduce the phishing messages before they get into the user's mailbox. And the second is we can try to prevent users from being exploited if they actually click on that link contained in the phishing email. So the prevention part is the DMARC solution. And the DMARC is domain-based message authentication, reporting, and conformance. And it is uh, simply 
uh, an authenticated email system, or one would say that it is like an identity check for your organization and for your domain name. So basically with DMARC, you have a, a policy that you are publishing on your DNS record for your domain, telling everyone around the world who receives an email from your domain, how to handle that email. So when someone receives an email, and uh, that email com comes from your organization, the DMARC policies will actually prevent spammers and fishers from using your organization's domain for email fraud or your domain to be used for uh, phishing purposes. DMARC also adds a, an increase in the customer confidence and trust because uh, no one, if you properly implement DMARC, no one will be able to use your domain to send emails on your behalf. And I'm happy to say that most of the major email providers like Gmail, Yahoo, Microsoft Outlook, Office 365, they all understand DMARC policies. And uh, another thing that DMARC adds is it will help uh, protect the integrity of your domain, so if um, of your brand. So if you if you if you are a commercial organization and you're providing services, uh, your brand's integrity will be maintained because no one will be able to send emails for your domain or spoofing your domain, acting like you know that that specific email is coming from from you. If you are a government organization, this becomes a lot more important because you want to make sure that people are not using your domain to send emails on behalf of your organization that may spread false information about specific events, about you know, accidents, natural disasters, etc., to cause chaos. And we know that cyber is being used more and more by cyber criminals and, and other, uh, you know, uh, ill-aimed organizations that, that wants to cause damage, and, and DMARC will help you uh, mitigate that, that risk. So, uh, so some of the benefits that we want to talk about DMARC is it will provide a way for participating senders and receivers to streamline the analysis process by coordinating their efforts. What that means is when receiving email box and sender email box agrees on DMARC, uh, both entities, once when they are exchanging emails, uh, will know how to handle that specific email and there will be no way to actually, uh, it's someone else to act as that organization and send email on their behalf. Uh, as I mentioned, it is supported by Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft, and that is about 85% of the consumers' mailboxes in the United States. And it is about 70% uh, of the consumer inboxes worldwide are protected by DMARC. So uh, because in order for DMARC to properly work, both sender and receiver have to implement DMARC properly, uh, by knowing that 70% of the consumer email boxes are already protected by DMARC, all you have to do is enable DMARC on your mail server side so that you can actually protect your brand, protect your identity, and protect your users. Another uh, value that DMARC provides, and we are going to talk about the reporting feature of DMARC, is it will provide insight into attempts to spam fish or even spear phishing using your organization's brand. So whenever you publish a DMARC policy, you will actually tell the world how to handle that specific email, and also you will ask the recipient mail servers to send you daily reports on the type of emails that they are receiving uh, as your domain. As you collect all this global reporting uh, from mail servers around the world for your domain, you will actually have a visibility into 
exactly who is trying to uh, spoof your domain, whether your domain is being used as a spear phishing campaign or it is used for you know, uh, email fraud. Uh, some statistics about the, 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 the cyber security for uh, small businesses is uh, Semantic reports that about 43% of the cyber attacks are targeting small businesses. And unfortunately, 60% of, this, of those small companies go out of business within six months of a cyber attack. So we know that uh, recovering from a, a, a successful cyber attack can be extremely costly. And uh, actually, Panama Institute reports that each cyber attack or each record costs about, about seven to eight hundred dollars per incident to recover from. And uh, although 48% of data security breaches are caused by acts of malicious intent, the remaining is caused by human error and system failure. And that is what DMARC is trying to address. So how does DMARC work? When, uh, actually, before going into that, the, 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 it is also important that DMARC is a tool and in order for this tool to work properly, you need to make sure that it is properly implemented. Otherwise, it could actually break your mail system. Uh, the DMARC under the hood requires two main and very well known protocols. It requires properly implemented sender policy framework, and it also requires properly implemented domain keys identified mail, DKIM. And uh, these two protocols must be properly controlled and implemented in order for DMARC to successfully work and protect your identity and brand. As you know, the, the SPF or sender policy framework basically enables you to tell the world what IP addresses are authorized to send email for your domain and you publish these IP addresses in your DNS record in the form of a text record. The DKIM or domain keys identified mail actually adds a digital signature, which adds an additional layer of authentication for the sender so that when recipient of that email receives the information, they can grab your public key from your DNS server, decrypt the signature, and verify that that email actually did come from the authorized mail server. When you do send an email, there are a couple policies that you can publish on your DNS server. You can publish a non-policy, which simply tells the world that you are compliant in DMARC and uh, in a way hints to the world that you are beginning to implement DMARC uh, properly and you, you want to collect uh, reports. So basically, uh, anyone who receives email from your domain, they do not quarantine it. They do not reject that email. However, you will get daily reports for your domain. And that, that those daily reports actually will enable you to identify the mail servers that may be sending email on your behalf and you can go through those reports and identify the IP addresses and domains that are sending emails and use that information to tighten down your SPF and DKIM implementation. The second level of policy that you can publish on your uh, DNS record for DMARC is quarantine. It basically tells the world that if SPF or DKIM checks fail, the messages are going to be sent to the spam or junk folder of that user. They are not going to be rejected. They will still be delivered, but they will be marked as spam. And the third is the hardest uh, or the most strict uh, level of uh, policy which basically tells the world, if you do receive an email that says that it is coming from my domain and uh, SPF or DKIM verifications 
fail, do not accept that message and simply drop it. So we do recommend to organizations to start with a non-policy, to start collecting the reports, and then gradually move into the reject policy. But you have to realize that if you are publishing a reject policy and your SPF or DCAM implementation is not uh, properly configured, then uh, that there is a chance that legitimate emails will be rejected and will not be delivered. So simply, the way DMARC works is a sender, email, sender a mail server sends an email to the recipient's mail server. By the way, if we can mute our microphones uh, so that we can eliminate the background noise, that would be great. Uh, so this is an overview of the, the way DMARC works under the hood. Sender inbox sends an email and the organization's mail server sends that email to the recipient's email server. When recipient's email server receives that email and realizes that there is a DMARC and, and DKIM uh, you know, attached to that email, it will actually go back to sending organization's DNS server and it will look at the published DMARC records. And these published DMARC records are going to be in the form of these non, quarantine, and reject. After getting this policy from the uh, sender mail server, orga sender organization's mail server's DNS records, it, it will look at the policies, and if it is a reject policy, you know, it will handle it appropriately. If it is a, a you know, if the policy is non, and the, uh, the DKIM and SPF verifications fail, it will simply send it out. But if the policy is quarantine, then it will go into the quarantine or spam folder. So, but from your user's perspective, this is not uh, visible to the user. And uh, once this is properly configured, it is in a way, set it and forget it. You properly configure it and and you, you start protecting your domain immediately. So we did talk about reports. And in DMARC, there are two types of reports that you can receive. The first one is an aggregate report. And second one is forensics report. The reports are sent in XML format. So the, the challenge here is, uh, obviously, you know, not many of us are uh, very fluent in reading XML. You know, we need applications that can actually consume these reports and make sense of them. And there are freely and commercially available solutions that enable you to take these reports, put them into a repository, and start generating some, uh, you know, some sort of high-level reports on your email traffic globally. The number and the length of the reports that you receive will depend on amount of email sent. And this is not necessarily the amount of email you are sending, but amount of email that may also be using your domain uh, for malicious purposes. And as we mentioned before, these reports will actually give you an insight into which messages were marked as suspicious. And it will enable you to troubleshoot email problems that may be related to SPF, DKIM, or DMARC implementation. Couple of the large organizations who have uh, implemented DMARC, uh, we did a survey with them, we talked to them, and the Aetna case study is Basically, after implementing DMARC properly each year, they are stopping approximately 60 million fraudulent email messages from being delivered. So this basically results in lowering the risk and bettering the engagement. And their click-through rates, which basically is the rate when Aetna sends email to their customers, how many people actually click on that link, uh, which indicates the 
the uh, consumers uh, trust and confidence on the brand they said that it increased and improves by 10 percent every year and they say dmark adds a trust component to emails and is a core component to etna's trusted email program another quote that we received from head of her majesty's revenue and customs Cybersecurity in uk indicated that in one year they have stopped 300 million phishing emails that were fraudulently using their email addresses so in the first case in the etna case Aetna, uh, DMARC enabled Aetna to increase consumer confidence on their brand so that when Aetna sends emails to their consumers, their consumers take that email seriously and they act on it. In the second case, the Majesty's Revenue and Customs Cybersecurity, they actually stopped 300, 300 million fraudulent emails that were using their domain for malicious purposes. So a couple of things to identify uh, and, and highlight with DMARC. I mean, obviously it is not a silver bullet. So DMARC does not protect against variations of organization's domain name. So if your organization's domain is, uh, you know, say, uh, lacnic.org, and somebody changes, you know, the second or the, the, the I in the neck to a lowercase l and sends email as that domain, obviously DMARC is not going to prevent that email from being delivered. So it will not prevent uh, what we say sister domains or cousin domains uh, to be used for malicious purposes. And if it is not implemented uh, correctly, it may break your email system. That's why we are, this, uh, stress the importance of starting with a non-policy and just make sure that your syntax is correct and make sure that your SPF and DKIM implementation is working properly before pushing out the DMARC policy. For large organizations, DMARC actually can be a time-consuming implementation. If there are multiple subdomains that are used in your organization, you have to identify those subdomains and you have to identify all other organizations who are allowed to send email on your behalf and contact those organizations and make sure that SPF and DKIM policies are properly configured in your DNS records reflecting those organizations' mail server. There are vendors out on the internet that will actually you know, work with you and they will help alleviate uh, these configuration challenges, but obviously there is going to be a cost associated with it. Also, to prevent denial of service attacks, only the first 10 of those DNS lookups are evaluated. So if you, uh, if you have a SPF domain lookup limit, work around this to use an IP address. However, that could lead to other issues. So, uh, one other thing to mention is UK government has mandated all UK government entities to implement DMARC properly by the end of 2017. That is a, a mark that they are probably going to miss, but you know it is mandated and organizations are working towards implementing and configuring DMARC for all UK.gov subdomains. So when we were talking to organizations who uh, should implement DMARC or, DMARC or try to implement DMARC, what we identified is that they had two challenges. The first one is that they didn't have the know-how. They didn't know that this technology existed freely. Or the second is they didn't have the technical skills and they thought that it was too complicated. So in order to address these challenges, we put out a website. It is dmark.globalcyberalliance.org. And it is really a closest thing to an easy button that, that you will have. What it will enable you to do is, once you go to the website and you put in your domain name, it will scan your domain 
and it will tell you what policies you actually have implemented already. After checking these policies, it will show you the, the screen on the, the top left corner, which you know in this case says SPF has been implemented. Uh, we don't know or we're not sure about the DKIM, and then DMARC has not been implemented. We actually have developed a DKIM scanner which will properly check whether DKIM is implemented or not as well. And after uh, going through this, you will be able to click on any of these items, SPF, DKIM, or DMARC, which will take you through a, a very simple wizard. So in this case, for the DMARC, it will ask you what policy you want to implement. And if this is your first time, we do recommend non-policy, which will bring you to the second screen, which will ask you which email address aggregate reports should be sent to. And you can just list you know, uh, email addresses in this list. Uh, that will receive the aggregate reports. And then this, the last screen is going to be where the forensic report should be sent to. Again, list the email addresses here, click next. And at the end of the screen, this uh, wizard will actually give you a policy that will uh, enable you to just take and put it in your DNS record as the text record, and you will be implementing DMARC. I'm happy to report that this wizard is available in many languages, including Chinese, Japanese, English, Bulgarian, Russian, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. So for this audience, you know, it, it is available in Spanish, Portuguese, and French, and we are adding new uh, languages uh, almost monthly. So this is the end of the DMARC portion of the webinar. I will stop now and see if we have any questions. Does anybody has any question to Adnan about uh, this uh, implementation or this solution? This is the um, the opportunity, if you have uh, any question, please. Graciela, while the folks are thinking of their questions, if they have any, um, yeah. I would just like to note that um, since we launched the tool last fall, we've had yes. more than 2,000 uh, domains uh, move through our system and become protected by DMARC. We're really proud of that. Uh, we've had, um, I can't remember how many um, people have come and checked their domain, but we've seen about a 20% conversion rate to DMARC. So some of those organizations are using our wizard to go through the DMARC process. And some of those organizations are then realizing that they need, um, that their systems are a bit more complicated because they're larger organizations and they have many subdomains. Um, okay. And they're obtaining professional <laughs> services uh, for DMARC implementation. So we have, we one, have, question. We have one question. Uh, have you seen it? Um, yes. Admin? Okay. So the question is the validations on an email recipient are done automatically, or there is something that needs to be enabled? So this is done on the MTA. So basically, on your mail servers automatically if it is configured properly. So you basically configure your mail server. And then after that configuration is done, all the validation is done automatically. If you are using like Office 365 or, or a Gmail or Google hosted apps, they actually have an easily configurable wizard that enables you to add DMARC compliance to your you know, Office 365 or Google hosted mail. But once that is configured, all the checks are done automatically. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions? Okay, thank you. So maybe we can move to the next session and we will have the, the contacts uh, to keep in contact. Later we will sure. see. Them.
Okay. Absolutely. Thank uh, you. So let's let's you know keep the questions coming, and at the end of the Internet Immunity System, if there are other questions that that come to your mind about DMARC, please post them on the chat box, and we will be happy to answer them. Uh, so with that, we will move on to Internet Immunity System. And what the Internet Immune System is, a global anycast, open recursive DNS infrastructure that adds a layer of security to everyone around the globe, completely free of charge, and while respecting their privacy concerns. So the overall idea is, we stood up a global DNS infrastructure, and we started talking to a threat intelligence provider and get them to donate their threat intelligence data into this infrastructure so that anyone using this DNS infrastructure, if they try to resolve a domain that is malicious, they simply get an NX domain response. So this was a, a challenging and an and arduous task. The first thing we needed to address was, how do you build a globally distributed DNS infrastructure that is resilient to faults and it is you know, uh, fast and efficient? To do that, we partnered with an organization called PCH, Packet Clearing House. Uh, some of you may already be uh, familiar with PCH as you are part of uh, uh, LACNIC. So we partnered with PCH and we built the global Anycast DNS infrastructure. And the reason we partnered with PCH is because they have been doing DNS since early 90s. And uh, they currently maintain the DNS infrastructure for over 300 top level domains, including couple single letter root servers. So I mean, their business is DNS, they do DNS very well, and they've been doing it for a very long time. So we partnered with them to build this global infrastructure. And uh, the second thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to address the, the data and the privacy controls. So what we are doing to address the privacy is we are making sure that nowhere in our infrastructure is the source IP address of the queries are recorded. So when a query comes into our infrastructure, the, what we do is we, we look at the query and we take that query and we look at the source IP address and we do a quick geolocation down to a city level. So only down to a city level do we record the source IP address's geolocation. And then we discard the source IP address. The reason we keep the geolocation information is because we want to make sure we can build heat maps and we can tell the world on our website where specific threat campaigns are targeting. So, uh, but that also means that we cannot do individual reporting of the blocks, which I will come to uh, in a couple uh, slides later. But the overall, the, the way system works is you configure your DNS server, which is in uh, step two, to use our DNS server as the upstream resolver. And when uh, you request to resolve a domain that is malicious, we do a lookup to our threat list and we send you an NX domain response. So from the endpoints perspective, that domain does not exist and they get a resolution error. So a couple a key milestones and goals. I mean, this project is about almost a year old right now. We started in the later part of uh, August of 2016. We stood up the service in four months. Currently, we have a worldwide pilot underway. And the way we are measuring the effectiveness of the service is by counting the number of blocks we do on a daily basis. We do have multiple threat intelligence providers. Currently, we have 17 different threat intel providers feeding data into the system. We have, the, uh, we have two more threat intel providers who agreed to give us data, and we are working on the integration. By November, 
we are uh, our goal is to have at least 20 different threat intel providers feeding data into this infrastructure in 2017 and 2018 our goal is to build a global honey network regarding iot devices and collect threat intelligence from that honey network and feed that threat intelligence into the DNS platform so that through DNS, we can also provide protection for IoT devices. When we are talking about threat intel providers giving us data, we give something back to them. And I want to make sure that that is clearly identified. What we give back to the threat intel provider is anonymized telemetry about the domains they share with us. So there are a couple key words here. The first word is anonymized telemetry. On the telemetry we share with the threat intel provider, in nowhere do we include any information regarding the source IP address or the organization that query came from. The second is, the second key word is the domains they share with us. So we give them anonymized telemetry for the domains they share with us. Meaning, uh, if they give us abc.com as malicious, we will give them this JSON blob anytime there is a resolution request for abc.com. Meaning, no one has access to the entire data set that GCA collects. And the data that we collect is purely used for providing security and bettering the service. And it is not used for any other purpose. Uh, how this project is different from uh, other free or commercial DNS service providers is, one, we do get telemetry from many different providers and not only one or two. So as I said, we have 18 different, 17 different providers, two under the works, and we're probably gonna have one more by, the, by November. And uh, our goal is to have a clearinghouse of, of a malicious domain list that is updated on a daily basis that can be used to provide this base level security for everyone around the globe uh, without you know, having them implement any software or hardware within their infrastructure. We do focus on the privacy of our users. So most of the DNS providers will take that data and they use that data for uh, commercial purposes. They will use it for marketing purposes. So the DNS data that is collected uh, can be easily analyzed for identifying marketing trends for specific geographic regions. And uh, then uh, these providers take that data and they either use that data for their own marketing purposes or they sell that data to marketers and advertisers. Through this platform, you are not compromising from your privacy while getting benefit from 17, right now 17 different threat intel feeds. We are not, a filtering organization and i want to make that clear we are not a filtering organization we do not care if uh, your organization's policy requires to block social media sites or you know gambling sites or adult content as long as those sites are not serving malware we, we are not going to block them so this actually resonates very well with uh, educational institutions because they don't want to block anything and for those organizations who want to block uh, those you know uh, different categories you know they can use commercially available services to achieve that while using our dns as an additional layer of protection for you know getting the benefit of these threat intel providers uh, the, the last uh, point that I want to make about how this is different is this project will enable the internet community a compound view of the threat landscape. We are working on building global heat maps that will tell the world exactly where specific threat campaigns are targeting. 
And this will enable the internet community to more efficiently fight those cyber crimes in their specific region. Couple things that we have completed in development is the telemetry pipeline, the threat intelligence comparative analysis pipeline, which basically enables us to say which threat intel company on the internet is providing providing better quality and more unique threat intel list. Uh, we have built the whitelisting system, which enables us to uh, get automated threat intel feeds from organizations and then take those feeds and run them through the whitelisting to make sure that we are not blocking domains that could be false positive or that could have a significant impact on the operation of the, the organization's uh, 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 internet connection. For example, you know, we don't want to block a domain in AWS, uh, or we don't want to block you know, Azure.com and all its subdomains, etc. And the last thing that we built is the threat intelligence collection platform, which enables us to automate the entire threat intelligence consumption process. And this platform is actually Actually, not only that platform, but our entire platform will be open sourced as soon as uh, the, 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 it is well commented and, and cleaned out. So our goal is to run a very transparent organization and anything and everything we do, we will make sure that we open source it, we give it away so that if there are other organizations who wants to do what we are doing, they should be able to do that because our funding model is coming from asset forfeiture and donations. We don't, we don't have any commercial you know, aspect or dimension to our, uh, our uh, program and organization. Couple things that, uh, that uh, highlights the efficacy of the solution so far is we are getting between 60 to 120 million queries a day right now. And this is still in the early adoption phase. Uh, on one instance, uh, we brought on a university in Malaysia, and on the first day, we blocked about 1 million malicious domain lookups. Currently, we are averaging about uh, up to 30,000 domains a day. And uh, the reason this is only 30,000 is because of the caching. Most of the resolvers are uh, configured as uh, caching forwarders, so that once we send them a response, you know, all the follow-up responses are responded by uh, those resolvers and not through us. I am happy to say that this slide is updated and right now we have 505,000 endpoints that we are protecting. And this is the, the latest number by uh, this Monday, yesterday. We are deployed on five continents. We have 17 different threat intelligence feeds already integrated and we have 105 organizations actually using this in pre-release form right now. Couple quotes is we saw one adapter, a state government in United States, actually said that they saw after two weeks of running this service, they saw a 50% decrease in their AV alerts and about 30% decrease in IDS alerts. Now these are staggering numbers for a service that does not cost any money, does not ask you to compromise from your privacy, and it does not require you to install any hardware or software in your environment. The only thing it requires is for you to spend five minutes to configure your DNS server to use our servers as your upstream resolvers, and that's all. I'm happy to say that again, uh, when we made this slide, we had 21 resolvers. Right now, we have 30 resolver clusters around the globe. Just last week, we brought on a resolver cluster in, in Chile. And we are working on bringing more resolver clusters in, in uh, Latin America region uh, as we go forward. One other solution that we provided through this internet DNS uh, and internet immunity system is a, a website where actually you can go onto the website and you can put in a domain 
and uh, we will actually tell you whether we are blocking that domain or not. And if we are blocking, it will tell you which threat intel provider gave us that information. I see a couple questions coming up, and I'm going to address those questions as soon as uh, this, uh, we, we go to the end of this uh, slide deck. In order to take advantage of this solution, you simply send an email to gca-dns at globalcyberalliance.org. Basically, tell us the information about your organization, how many endpoints you have, and that you are interested in testing this service. And we will send you the two IP addresses of the service, and you will be ready to go. This is the end of this this portion of the presentation and i see that there are number of questions that been asked so i am actually going to address the dns questions first then we will go back to the dmark questions so the first question is do these solutions introduce some delay in responses so as i said if you look up pch packet clearing house they are a, a very globally distributed organization and unless you are using uh, root hints on your dns servers these solutions will add just as much delay as your organization using google dns or you know open dns or din dns etc or uh, level 3 dns you know quad fours quad eights etc so uh, it is not going to be a, a, a noticeable delay but obviously, you know, we are adding an additional sort of middleman uh, between your organization and root hints, so that if we have to go out and grab the response, uh, meaning that we don't have that response in our cache, it will add a delay. However, if we have the response in our cache, you will actually get a quicker response. The second question is, on the recursive DNS service, nothing is free. How do you pay for a global Anycast network? How do you scale this? And will it always be free? Great question. Uh, you know, I was hoping that I had addressed this in, in the presentation, but I'll repeat this again. Our organization is currently funded for $25 million over five years to reduce global systemic risk. And that is how this platform is funded but at the same time packet clearing house who is our solution partner who is another non-for-profit organization who receives significant amount of donation from various technology firms is contributing into this platform significantly our organization's funding model comes from asset forfeitures and other uh, non-for-profit donations so we do go to altruistic organizations and we ask for donations and we actually did receive another five million dollar donation into our organization this year and we are going out and looking for additional donations for continuing this effort uh, the question is how we scale this our budget already allows us to go up to 55 resolver clusters around the globe by november and by end of 2018 we are going to have over 100 resolver clusters completely distributed around the globe and uh, when the last question was will it always be free and the answer to that is yes this solution will always be free this solution will always respect your privacy and this solution will never take your data and use it for commercial purposes. I like to consider Global Cyber Alliance and the solutions that we are providing is similar to UNICEF. So we are UNICEF for cyber. We find solutions that are effective and impactful, and we find ways to make those solutions available to everyone around the globe completely free. And I am sick and tired of playing whack-a-mole where we run from one infection to another when we can actually very easily prevent most of these infections through a solution like this. And I really hope that 
organizations in your region take advantage of this solution because we think that we built this solution properly and accurately to provide that added value of service and if if you think we can do these services better please send us an email in the same email box and tell us how we can improve this service because this is a community effort this is a global effort and we love to hear from your expertise we love to hear your comments so that we can actually better the service there are uh, there is a, a, a spanish question that that if i can uh, get i out, i uh, I'm I wrote uh, the, the same question in English because okay. Neal Quiroz is asking if there exists some material about this solution in Spanish. And also I would like to tell to Nico, to Nicolas from CERT uh, UNLP that uh, we will be, after, after the presentation, I will uh, uh, tell to everybody where the, the, this webinar will be recorded uh is is it uh where it will be available for everybody okay yep. and also the presentations on what site but um let's go on with that one and see that okay. later one uh, question we had about dmark is can dmark be implemented for one domain without affecting other domain yes i mean dmark needs to be implemented on a per domain or subdomain basis so if you have a subdomain, then uh, you have to put that text record on that specific subdomain in order for DMARC to be effective on that subdomain and not the parent domain. For example, if someone receives an email from your mail server or from any mail server saying that the email came from abc.com, the DMARC uh, recipient will look at the DNS record for abc.com and look at the text record for abc.com. But if they receive an email from, you know, say uh, xyz.abc.com, then uh, the recipient is gonna look at xyz.abc.com for that text record. So yes, one is not going to affect other and in order to properly cover all of the subdomains, you need to implement it for each subdomain. Any other questions? Okay, maybe uh, you or Amy wants to give a summary of what we saw. Absolutely. So, uh, to to summarize this webinar, we are Global Cyber Alliance, and we are a non-for-profit organization. We are not a pay-to-play organization meaning anyone can be a member and you don't have to be a member to take advantage of these solutions. We are currently offering two solutions to the world that is available completely free of charge. One is a DMARC wizard, which enables you to implement DMARC easily on your DNS server by answering couple simple questions. And if you have further questions about the DMARC, or its implementation, you can contact us and we will support your efforts. We want to make sure that as many organizations as possible implement DMARC globally. The second solution we are offering is the DNS solution, which is a global Anycast network for DNS service. And through this solution, we are partnering with uh, Threat Intel providers to get Threat Intel data and use that Threat Intel data to add additional layer of security for organizations around the world who is using the service. And while doing that, we are making sure that we are respecting your privacy. And the, uh, for the DNS service, the key uh, answer or the key, key thing to highlight is we have partnered with Packet Clearing House, PCH, to be able to provide this solution free of charge to everyone around the globe. So okay. if I may make a comment, um, the 
DMARC solution, I've put the links to both websites uh, in the chat window so uh, you can go there. Both websites are available to translate it into Spanish. Uh, you just choose in the upper left hand corner the Spanish flag or in the drop down menu and it will automatically translate to Spanish for you. I can't guarantee that it will be the version of Spanish that you speak as we use the Google Translator. Um, but I think it uh, should be sufficient for everyone to be able to use. Um, and then for DMARC, the, the actual DMARC setup wizard is translated into Spanish and it is not using the Google Translator. We had a translator work with us to translate it so uh, that it was uh, clear and understandable. Um, uh, so hopefully you will find that very useful. Um, and then with the DMARC tool also, if you go to the DMARC website, you will find a repository of resources, including some training videos to uh, help you further understand DMARC and how to implement it. Unfortunately, those are not available in Spanish yet, although we are working to get them translated so that we can make them available in Spanish and other languages as well. Uh, the DNS website, uh, um, is uh, also available, uh, translated into Spanish. Um, again, the translation is in the upper left-hand corner. Just select the language that you would like to see it in. For either project, if you have further information or would like to contact us um, for further discussion on it, we're more than happy to talk to you. Um, Graciela will distribute our information as well as this PowerPoint. Um, for you to be able to use further um, internally in your organization. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for Amy and Adnan. Uh, I am sure that uh, you can contact them whenever you want. Thank you very much for everyone having attending this um, webinar, the recorded webinar and the presentation will be available on WARP's website by the end of this week and also the presentation. And you can get in touch with, um, also with uh, Amy or uh, Adnan to the contact that they, uh, they put in the presentation. And also you can contact us, um, I'm going to write here, so, Whenever you f you need to contact us, feel free to do it. I'm going to write the contacts of us here in the dialogue. Okay. Well, Graciela, oh, does any you. does anybody has any question? Okay. Yes, Amy. Thank um, you so much for inviting us to um, give this presentation and thank you everyone for um, joining us. We really look forward to hopefully working with you and hopefully providing um, some solutions that you will find valuable uh, for your use. Okay. And you are welcome also to share this information with, with your colleagues. Um, and point other people in the direction of these resources. Okay. Okay, thank you very much again. And I hope we can go on working together, showing our community some tools for a better and secure internet for everybody. Okay, thank you very much for everybody. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.